Hi everybody, it's Beth from the West Dallas Public Library. Welcome to episode two in our book club, where we are reading what is the Declaration of Independence. Now, before we get to it, my daily reminder to sign up for the summer reading program if you haven't already. And if you already did, well, make sure you log your reading. And remember, every 20 minutes of reading is uh, another book you can cross off your log. So if this goes for over 20 minutes, it counts. Because if someone reads to you, that counts. So away we go. Chapter 2, Taxes and More Taxes. Besides taxing colonists, King George did other things that made the situation in America grow even more tense. In 1761, he ordered a renewal of the writs of assistance, which were a kind of search warrant. British custom officers and soldiers were allowed to search shops, warehouses, and even people's homes. This was to make sure colonists were only buying things made in Great Britain or by the British. If goods from other countries were found, the shopkeeper or homeowner had to pay a fine to the king. The colonists were furious. It was one thing to search a warehouse or even a shop, but searching people's homes was an outrage. James Otis, a lawyer from Massachusetts, went to court. He tried to get searches stopped. He is often credited with one of the most important lines in American history. Taxation without representation is tyranny. This idea that it's completely wrong to tax people without letting them have a voice in the matter would become a rallying cry for the American colonists. But King George III didn't seem to care what the colonists thought. He needed more and more money. So Great Britain's parliament passed more and more taxes on the colonies. The Sugar Act of 1764 hit the colonists hard. It was a tax on all sugar, molasses, wine, rum, and even some lumber and iron. Every home in the colonies used sugar every single day. The sugar tax hurt the economy of the colonies. Rum was a big business in the colonies as it was used to trade for African slaves. Lumber and iron were important businesses too, and they were heavily taxed now. But Great Britain couldn't care less. It wanted as much money as it could get out of the colonists. Later the same year, Parliament passed the Currency Act. Before this, the American colonies printed their own money. It was used to buy everyday goods. The Currency Act forced Americans to use British money. This angered the colonists because their colonial money was now worthless. People in the colonies took to the streets to protest against the King and Parliament. But this was only the beginning. Can you believe it gets worse? I can believe it. We're only at chapter two. The Stamp Act of 1765 was like an explosion in the American colonies. Up until the Stamp Act, Americans mostly paid taxes to Great Britain on items sold to other countries. For example, if a merchant in Pennsylvania sold lumber to a Spanish company, the Pennsylvania company had to pay Great Britain a tax on that sale. But any lumber that the Pennsylvania merchant sold to other colonial customers was not taxed. But with the Stamp Act, colonists paid a tax on items sold in America. For instance, anything printed on paper, newspaper, contracts, wills, even playing cards, had to have a British stamp. And there was a price for the stamp. If a newspaper cost one pence before the Stamp Act, 
afterward it cost two pence. The Stamp Act, the Stamp Act affected every colonist, and all of them hated it. Riots broke out across the colonies. In Boston, a man named Samuel Adams urged colonists to fight back. First, they stormed the office of the British tax commissioner. The commissioner collected all the taxes for Great Britain. Then, protesters went to his home. He was so frightened by the crowd that he quit his job the very next day. In New York, two thousand angry colonists ransacked the house of British Major Thomas James. Why? He boasted that he would ram the stamp tax down colonists' throats at the point of a sword. I see why they didn't like him. It was only after colonists stopped buying British goods that Parliament ended the Stamp Act. The plan had backfired. Did that put an end to the trouble? Nope. King George and Parliament came up with a new tax scheme. It was called the Townshend Acts. These 1767 acts taxed all colonial paint, oil, and glass. Oh, and one other thing, tea. Again, people in the colonies rebelled. They protested in the streets and they boycotted meaning they refused to buy British goods. This was hard on many households. Only the British sold certain things that most colonial families depended on. It was not easy to give those things up. What colonists minded the most was doing without tea. Tea was a favorite drink in the colonies. Even though it was expensive, most colonists were regular tea drinkers. Boiling water was a common way to purify water. So, in every cup of tea, colonists were drinking both clean water and a delicious tasting beverage. Most tea came to America on British ships that had first picked it up in other parts of the world. Now, colonists found ways to get tea illegally. Some tea was shipped in from other countries without the British authorities ever finding out. Some tea was grown in America, including teas made out of mint or chicory. The colonists agreed to tough it out and continue the boycott. It was important to make the king and parliament understand how fed up they were over these taxes. Eventually, the boycott was a success or mostly a success. Once again, Great Britain was losing too much money. So Parliament did away with the taxes on glass, paper, and sugar in 1770. In fact, they got rid of almost everything in the Townshend Acts. Only one tax was left in place, the tax on tea. Surely the colonists would see how reasonable the king and the British government were being. Do you think so? Doubt it. <coughs> Excuse me. Chapter 3, Blood in Boston. Boston, Massachusetts, in early 1770, was a tense city. Very tense. There were so many protests and gatherings that Great Britain sent hundreds of soldiers to the city to keep the peace. Instead, seeing so many soldiers in their streets only made Bostonians even angrier. In late February, a crowd gathered at the home of a British tax collector. Rather than trying to calm down the colonists, an officer came out and fired his gun at the crowd an 11-year-old boy named Christopher Sider was killed. All of Boston was shocked. Even the royal governor of Massachusetts, a man chosen by the king, was outraged. A record number of Bostonians attended the boy's funeral. The sad event was as much a political protest as a time to mourn the death of a child. 
Only one week after Christopher Sider's funeral, a Boston merchant insulted a British soldier. The soldier struck the man with his rifle. In a flash, 200 Bostonians were at the scene. Then a few more British soldiers arrived. Suddenly, the crowd began to throw sticks, stones, and snowballs at them. When one of the soldiers was hit, the others pointed their guns and began firing. Three colonists died on the spot. One was Crispus Addux, a sailor of African and Native American descent. Of the eight wounded, two died within days. That brought the total number of colonists killed to five. The tragic incident quickly became known as the Boston Massacre, and it fueled the colonists' hatred of the British. News of the massacre quickly spread. There were more angry protests against the British in cities across the colonies. In Boston, the royal governor promised a full investigation of the murders. Even he knew that the British soldiers had gone too far. Eight British soldiers were brought to trial for the murders. It is safe to bet that they were among the most hated men in Boston. Probably many colonists hoped they would hang for their crime. But the soldier's lawyer was determined to see that they received a fair trial. Who was their lawyer? John Adams. This may seem surprising since John Adams was very much against British rule. And indeed, many Bostonians were angry with Adams for defending the British soldiers. But Adams felt that everyone deserved to be fairly represented in court. So he took the job, even after getting death threats. In the end, the jury decided that six of the eight soldiers were not guilty. Only two were convicted of murder and executed. The trial made Adams an unpopular man in Boston. He lost a lot of clients and his family suffered. But right up until the day he died, Adams believed he had done the right thing. Chapter 4 the Boston Tea Party. Sam Adams wasn't going to let a trial put the Boston Massacre to rest. To rest. He egged on his fellow. Wait, Sam Adams wasn't going to let a trial put the Boston Massacre to rest. He egged on his fellow citizens, reminding them all to remember the bloody massacre. And that wasn't all that angered him. Once again, King George and Parliament aggravated the situation in America. The Tea Act was passed, which forced colonists to buy tea only from a British tea company. The Tea Act was too much. In Boston, the Sons of Liberty met daily to find a way to stop the Tea Act and in late November, 1773, they saw their chance. Okay, so they mentioned the Sons of Liberty. I'm gonna tell you about them really quick. Samuel Adams was from Boston. He was a representative in the Massachusetts legislature when the Stamp Act was passed in 1765. His cousin was John Adams, who later became America's second president. So John Adams, who defended the British soldiers, became our second president. Samuel was much more hot-headed than his cousin. He was leader of a group called the Sons of Liberty. It urged colonists to rebel against Great Britain and unfair taxes. Other members included Patrick Henry, Paul Revere, and John Hancock. These men met secretly to come up with ways to fight the king. The Sons of Liberty used propaganda to feed the anger of the colonists. Propaganda is information that tries to convince people of certain ideas. Adams and his friends, that's Samuel Adams and his friends, used posters, newspaper cartoons, and pamphlets to show how unfair the king and his laws were. 
Sam Adams had a knack for stirring up crowds. Sometimes this led to violence. Sometimes British customs officers were captured, then tarred and feathered. Colonists poured hot tar on them and then covered them with feathers. And the homes of some British commissioners and military leaders were destroyed. Not all the Sons of Liberty were in favor of these violent acts, but America's freedom from Great Britain and King George III was Sam Adams' only goal. He was one of the most popular and most important leaders of the American Revolution. Okay, so the Sons of Liberty saw their chance to stop the Tea Act. Three British ships docked in Boston Harbor, carrying hundreds of chests of tea. Armed with guns, Sam Adams and the Sons of Liberty immediately lined the harbor. They did not let the British unload the tea from the ships. Every day and every night, Boston citizens kept watch at the harbor, making sure the tea stayed right where it was. The standoff lasted for more than two weeks. Then, on December 16, 1773, Adams and the Sons of Liberty decided it was time to do something daring. They would get rid of the tea once and for all. That very night, some 200 men and teenage boys disguised themselves as Native Americans. The crowd marched onto the docks at Boston Harbor. Because only a few British soldiers were guarding the docks and ships, they put up no fight. They let the large armed crowd board the three boats. In four hours, the protesters dumped over 300 crates of tea, 46 tons of tea leaves into the bay. There was one heck of a tea party that night. The colonists had broken the law by destroying British goods. Colonists were frequently hanged for such crimes. However, the next day, the mood in Boston was upbeat. The rebels felt they had sent an important message to the king. They weren't going to stand for iron-handed control of the colonies anymore. Everyone involved in the Tea Party kept quiet about his part in the event. The men refused to admit anything when, que when questioned by British authorities. This was a time long before email, before telephones or telegrams. It took a month for news of the Tea Party to reach Great Britain, a whole month before they even knew it happened. When King George was told about it, all when King George was told about all the wasted tea floating in the Boston Harbor, he was mad, boiling mad. Okay, we'll stop there today. We will pick up tomorrow with the First Continental Congress. Until then, enjoy. Bye.